Hi, this is Dave Cole, and I'll be taking you through this module on data center cooling strategies. Um, cooling is a big part of, of design and operation in the data center, so it's important that we, that we have a good feel for cooling. So we're going to cover this in multiple modules. If you have any questions as we go through, please use the question comment box, and let's get started. We're going to talk about a couple cooling topics in this module. We're going to talk about comfort versus precision cooling. Um, really cooling people versus cooling machines in the data center. We're going to talk about some of the data center cooling issues, and then we'll start talking about some of the science behind data center cooling. So I always tell people cooling is easy, right? All we worry about is temperatures. Well, there's a couple different temperatures, dry bulb, wet bulb, dew point temperature, and wait a minute, well, we can't forget about humidity. So there's relative humidity and absolute humidity and uh, humidity ratio, and I guess we're going to talk about cooling. We probably should talk about some of the gas laws. Uh, wow. And we also, I guess, need to touch on computational fluid dynamics modeling and sensible heat versus latent heat versus total heat and air distribution and airflow and conduction and convection and radiation. And uh, okay, maybe I was wrong. Maybe cooling isn't easy, right? It's a lot involved. Managing precision cooling is more than just adjusting the temperature setting on a thermostat. It's more than just walking through going, whoa, it's hot in here, let's turn down the AC. Because we have to worry about humidity. We have to worry about some other things as well. Uh, very complex relationships between temperature, pressure, volume, humidity, airflow. If we get any of those wrong, it's really going to hurt us on how well we're cooling in the data center. And the traditional whole room approach to cooling may not be sufficient anymore for high density racks. It used to be we did, we worried about cooling a whole room. We might have to take some additional steps to cool down to the rack level uh, or down to the row level. The good news is there are a lot of new options for cooling, right? So while cooling itself isn't easy, uh, we've, got, we've got some new things we can use. We've got monitoring tools. We've got computational fluid dynamic modeling. These help us take some of the guesswork out of designing and maintaining our architecture, right? So we don't have to say, I hope this is enough cooling. We can, we can do some monitoring and some modeling to tell us ahead of time, yes, we're taking the right approach there. So we're going to look at the importance of cooling. Cooling is the removal of heat, okay? We don't actually cool something. We unheat things, right? So cooling is required to maintain the conditions that we want in the data center, both temperature and humidity. Cooling problems result in downtime. Just like power problems result in downtime, cooling problems result in downtime as well. So that decreases our overall system availability. So we need to address cooling just like we address power. And next to the IT equipment itself, cooling is our next biggest expense. And at some point may exceed the IT equipment. So cooling is a big deal. It's very expensive, very important, and obviously there's a lot that we have to address. When we're looking at data centers, we have to look at 24 by 7 cooling. Got to be cooled all the time. I, you know, at our house, we might say, well, we're gone for the, uh, for the week. We're on vacation, so maybe we can turn the temperature up a little bit. Or everybody works in the house, so we can turn the temperature up during the day. Or it's a little dry outside, so maybe we'll turn on a humidifier, maybe not. Uh, it's not too dry, it's not too hot, whatever. But when we're looking at a data center, it's really important that we're cooling all the time. So let's look at comfort versus precision cooling. Comfort air conditioning, it's okay if we have rapid temperature swings. My wife and I fight temperature all the time. I turn the thermostat up, she turns it down. I turn it down, she turns it up, right? And it's okay that we have these big temperature swings. People's body can handle that fine. Um, precision cooling, uh, air, I'm sorry, comfort air conditioning was designed for people. It doesn't worry about 24 by 7 by 365 applications. The weather's going to change a little bit. If it's winter time, we can put on a sweater if we need to be a little warmer. Can't put a sweater on a cooler, on a, on a uh, server. Precision cooling, IT rooms require a precise, stable environment. It's important that we don't have big temperature swings and humidity swings when we're looking at servers and routers and other IT equipment. IT equipment also produces very concentrated heat loads that are very sensitive to temperature and humidity changes. We're talking a lot of heat being generated by this equipment. 
we have to control humidity. We don't think about humidity control very much when we're looking at, at comfort um, cooling, right? But when we look at a data center, the humidity must be controlled. And we have to have tighter controls over both humidity and temperature. So let's look at where is the heat generated in the data center. It all starts at the chip level. Right? We put a bunch of transistors on a chip and we cram more and more things onto a chip. All of a sudden these chips start generating a lot of heat. I put a lot of these chips into a server and now my server is generating a lot of heat. Put a bunch of servers in a rack and now my rack is generating a lot of heat. In some cases as much as two or three pizza ovens worth of heat. And then I put a bunch of these racks into a room and now my entire room is generating heat. The reason I bring this up is traditionally we've looked at cooling at the room level. But now we're starting to look at it more at the smaller uh, levels, right? We're starting to look at rack level cooling, server level cooling. Uh, there are companies working with some print technology to direct little blasts of, of uh, a liquid or air at the chip level to cool down an individual chip. If we can cool the chip, we may have the whole problem solved, right? Because my server is not going to generate a lot of heat, nor my rack, nor my room. So it's important to know that all of these areas are being addressed right now. There is research being done in all of these areas of heat generation. So where is the heat generated in the data center? 70 to 90 percent of it's from our IT load. Servers and switches and routers and uh, other IT equipment generates a lot of heat. But there are some other things as well. Power distribution. Whenever I'm running power through a wire, that wire heats up. That wire generates some heat. Lighting generates heat. Uh, UPSs, just running a UPS and the losses in the UPS generate heat. And people in the data center generate heat. It's important to know that as well. So I'm trying to cool this load. Where is it? We have to know what it is I'm cooling. My IT equipment makes up a big portion of the load. UPS is PDU. I might also get external heat through walls and windows and roofs. It's why we typically don't put a data center on the top floor because of the heat through the roof. It's why we typically don't put windows in a data center. Uh, aside from the security aspect, heat from the windows. Uh, we typically put a data center not against an external wall. We put it inside of a, uh, inside of a building uh, so that I don't get that heat generation through these external walls. Uh, conduction from adjoining spaces. Whenever I open up um, a door to the data center, if it's hotter outside, that heat's going to come into the data center. And then we've got internal heat due to people and lights and other appliances. So what are some of the data center cooling issues? High and low temperature swings. Again, it's not so much the, the temperature. We can, we can stand higher temperatures in the data center. Most data centers are too cool. And we'll talk later about raising the temperature in the data center uh, to improve our energy efficiency. But what data centers don't like are big temperature swings. Uh, that can corrupt data processing, can shut down an entire system, and we may not even know why. It can also introduce defects to electronic chips and board components if I've got big swings in my, in my temperature. And I end up with these little transient, these little what I call sneaky problems. I'm not sure why they're there, what's causing them, but over time they continue to plague us. Right? A lot of these have been... been um, um, looked at and, and figured out that these are due to some high and low temperature swings. We also need to look at humidity in the data center. We don't want high humidity in the data center. That leads to uh, tape and surface deterioration, right? It leads to corrosion and condensation. Uh, we don't want that. The flip side is we don't want low humidity because that increases static electricity uh, discharge in the data center. And nobody ever wears those little bands that are supposed to reduce the uh, static discharges, right? So we want to reduce uh, the amount of static electricity in the air because that can also corrupt data and damage hardware. So again, things we just need to be aware of when we're looking at some of the cooling issues. So let's look a little bit at the science of cooling. We're going to look at some of the key terms. Uh, cooling, again, is the removal of heat. We don't cool things, we unheat them. It's an important concept, um, and as a mechanical engineering degree, I, I hold over a mechanical engineering degree, one of the classes I had to take was heat transfer, 
Uh, I'll say I'd take some thermodynamics, but we won't go there. But heat transfer, I'm going to give you as a, as a as bonus part of this course, I'm going to give you everything I remember about heat transfer. And luckily, I can do that on two slides, and I'll point those point those out as I get to those. But cooling is the removal of heat. So what is heat? It's just a form of energy, okay? And it, it varies from one body to another, and heat can transfer from one body to another. We have two different types of heat that we look at. One is called a sensible heat, or sometimes called dry heat. This is generated by IT equipment. So electrical equipment generates sensible heat, or dry heat. And it's called dry heat because there's no moisture associated with that. Latent heat is heat content associated with moisture. So that's what people generate. When we perspire, we are generating latent heat because there's also moisture associated with that. And, and we cool latent heat differently than we cool sensible heat. So some other terms. Temperature is a measure of the heat intensity, right? We've known temperature. We've known that one for a while. Humidity is the amount of water vapor that's present in the air. Refrigeration. We're going to talk about the refrigeration cycle. This is the process of removing heat. We're going to transfer it from one body to another body. So we're going to transfer it from the data center. We're going to transfer it to another body, which is typically outside. We're going to take the heat from inside and move it outside. We don't get rid of the heat. We just move it. And then this is an area that we're going to talk quite a bit about. CFM, cubic feet per minute. This is a measure of the movement of air. And what we're going to find out is we can't cool without moving air. Okay, we can make really cold air, but if we don't move that air, we're not going to remove any heat. And we'll walk through some of the uh, detailed uh, formulas and things behind that so you'll get a good feel for that. All right, so here's heat transfer semester one, everything I remember. Um, properties of heat transfer. Heat can only flow in one direction. It only goes from hot to cold. It's the only way that heat knows how to go. I can't put cold onto something. I can remove heat from something else, right? Heat cannot be destroyed. So I can't just destroy the heat in my data center, but what I can do is transfer it. So I can move heat from one object to another. Again, in our case, we want to move it from the data center to the outside, typically, right? Uh, second semester, semester of heat transfer got a little bit more interesting, but that really is, is pretty much what we covered for an entire semester. So let's look at some of the gas laws. Uh, a while back, there were a couple, couple people that were working on uh, examining the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. And Charles said, if I keep my pressure the same, what is the relationship between volume and temperature? And what he found out is that the volume is directly proportional to temperature. So if I increase temperature, volume will go up proportionally. If I increase volume, temperature will go up proportionally. Boyle's law. What Boyle said is, what if I keep, what if I keep uh, my, my temperature the same? What is the relationship between pressure and volume? What he found is that as pressure goes up, my uh, volume is going to go down. Right? So my pressure and volume are inversely proportional to each other. And then Guy Lussac said, what if I keep volume the same? What's the relationship between pressure and temperature? And he found that they were directly proportional to each other. So if you look at these three guys and what they were trying to do, they were all really trying to do the same thing. Understand this relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. So if you combine all these laws together, you get something called the ideal gas law which shows us the relationship between temperature, pressure, and volume of a gas. So N is the number of moles of gas, so how much, how much gas we have, and R is a universal gas constant. So you see the big things here. We see P and V, my pressure and volume, and its relationship to temperature. So what happens is, if pressure stays constant, increasing in temperature increases my volume as well, proportionally, right? Because Temperature and volume are on the opposite sides of that equation. Conversely, if I keep my volume the same, increasing temperature increases my pressure, or increasing pressure increases my temperature. So this is really important, not so much that you remember the ideal gas law, but that you understand there's a relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. Because we're going to see this again when we look at 
the refrigeration cycle and how it works. Do you have any questions? Please use the question and comment box. Thank you very much for joining us on this module and look forward to seeing you again soon.